And then we have this week's uh, lecture, which is called the Gaia Hypothesis, Earth as a Living Organism. All right, next slide. That is Gaia. Uh, she is a Earth Mother Goddess, and she was the brainchild of James Lovelock. He's still alive. He lives in England. And we have been looking at various ecological cycles and concepts. And when I say biogeological um, processes and things of that nature, it, it always gives people the idea that geology is here, evolutionary biology is here, uh, systematics is there, um, ecological dynamics is there, and that they're separate. And in a way they are, but what we now realize is that everything is connected. That <clears throat> you just can't take us out of the equation with part of the fabric of the universe and the biotic and the abiotic aspects interact with each other and affect each other. And so Lovelock was trying to get at that. He is an experimental scientist and um, so he was brought up in a very traditional way where there were a lot of compartments and what he came to realize is that there are compartments but they interact and so his Gaia hypothesis which I think um, someday we're going to rename but it says it states that global ecosystems sustain and regulate like a biological organism rather than an inanimate entity run by the automatic and accidental processes of geology. That's a, a nice way of saying that Gaia Earth is more like a living organism than it is a um, distant planet third from the sun. So here are some quotes that I love. Uh, it's uh, not that I'm going to test you on the quotes, but it's it's more trying to get into the mindset that everything affects everybody else, whether it's a body or rock or a mountain or a volcano or a tornado. So Gaia, meaning living earth, is more than the sum of its parts. It's more than the biosphere, the biota, which is us, the, ge the geology, etc. Gaia is a total planetary being. Gaia hypothesis supposes that the atmosphere, oceans, climate, crust of the earth are regulated at a state comfortable for life because of the behavior of living organisms. So when you talk about homeostasis, and I haven't talked about it that much in this class, but homeostasis is a way of having a feedback loop of having sensory neurons, so I'll take the human body, sensory neurons that would then feed to the brain and the brain would react. And uh, so if I stepped on a tack, I would have sensory neurons go to my brain in milliseconds and my brain would decide to contract those muscles in the feet and lower leg that would remove my foot from the tack. That's called negative feedback. Um, so homeostasis means that our bodies or our planet want to have things be at a basic level, like um, our oxygen levels are at a certain point uh, temperature. We're supposed to be um, 37 degrees C. Uh, if the temperature rises, we have a fever. If not, we're into hypothermia. Uh, so homeostasis is, is the body's or the planet's way of trying to maintain a consistency in oxygen levels, food levels, getting rid of waste, things of that nature. So homeostasis is maintained on the planet Earth by active feedback processes operated automatically and unconsciously by the biota, which is us. So for example, when I step on a tack, I don't think that, oh my God, I have to remove my foot. My foot is already removed from that tack before I can consciously react to the fact that I stepped on a tack. So that's, you're talking milliseconds, you're talking about unconscious reactions. Um, and he's saying that those types of automatic reactions can also occur on the planet. 
Solar energy sustains comfortable conditions for life, photosynthesis, all of our food pyramids, triangles, webs that we've been talking about. Life and its environment are so closely coupled that evolution concerns Geyer, not the organisms or the environment taken separately. So in other words, we're a fabric, we're a web. If you want to think about volcanoes and atmosphere, abiotic processes as being the warp, then the weft um, is going to be living organisms. Okay, but we all interact with each other. Okay, Daisy World is something that we're going to do next week, not this week. Um, but very briefly, and I will have a separate uh, lecture and explanation about this next week. But um, James Lovelock was called upon to prove this. And he said, I can make a very simple computer model where you have a theoretical planet that is kept at a constant temperature because it can either make white daisies, which would reflect the light and keep the planet cool, or black daisies, which would absorb the light and keep it hot. And uh, his model is used today, and you'll use it. It's very simple, very straightforward way without a lot of complications to get his point across. So you can look forward to this. Okay, so that's going to go into Daisy World, and we'll go into that later. All right, so what is the experimental evidence for Gaia being a living entity? So the first is temperature. Now, again, we're talking about geological time. We're talking about millions and millions of years. And we have the ability to go back in time and to do that. So here we go with the temperature. Let's see if we can go to the next slide. Temperature, hi -yo. here we go. This is us. The thing about temperature is, believe it or not, for the past millions and millions and millions of years, you, we have had no statistical increase in temperature. Now you're taking the entire globe. So if there's no change in the average global temperature from, I don't know, um, from the Permian time until now, which is millions and millions and millions of years, in the face of the fact that we are heated by the sun and solar energy warmth output has increased 30 to 40 percent over these millions of years. But we have not had it happen here. So our source has increased its heat and our planet has not. It has kept it at a temperature which is more conducive to life as we know it. So that's one uh, experimental proof for the Gaia hypothesis. Oxygen levels. Now Life created oxygen. Photosynthetic cyanobacteria created oxygen. When you had a crisis, way back when, in the Hadean era, where you ended up having the microbes run out of high energy fuel. Okay, so what we, and you have, we've covered this so that we realize you can't have oxygen too low, we'd die. You can't have it too high. Everything would catch on fire. So we like it around 20%. And that has happened. Now, again, how has it happened? Life, L-I-F-E, life. So when the oxygen temperatures or temperature, oxygen concentrations got too high, what happened was we changed and evolved to some of the cells uh, able to use oxygen and glucose, us, all organisms that do aerobic respiration or cell respiration do that. So life made it possible when it changed and evolved to have photosynthetic plants produce the oxygen, but then life made sure that the oxygen levels didn't get too high and organisms like ourselves, Homo sapiens knock that level 
down to 20% rather than 25% because we take in and use the oxygen and the glucose. So that's another example of life um, being the maintainer of um, planetary conditions. Okay, carbon dioxide. We all know that carbon dioxide is increasing due to uh, the burning of fossil fuels and that leads to global warming. Um, however, there are living organisms that can become sinks, S-I-N-K-S, sinks for carbon dioxide that I haven't yet talked about. And one of them are these tiny little algae that can make the equivalent of a seashell around it. And these algae can grow, or they tend to grow floating on the ocean in large algal mats, they're called M-A-T-S, uh, wherever you have a lot of industry, wherever you have a lot of burning of fossil fuel. And what these algae do is they are able to actively take the carbon dioxide in the air Remember, CO2 dissolves very well in the water, and they, the algae are able to take the CO2 and use it to make their shell. Now, when these organisms eventually die, they flow to the bottom, and the CO2 does not get re-released. Uh, all that happens is that the shells are there, um, one good example of this is the White Cliffs of Dover, uh, and those cliffs are due to these shells, um, and I'll, I'll tell you the name in a second, um, that had been lifted by a volcanic um, explosion, and these shells are white in color, and when you come from Calais in France and take a ship over, you can actually see the white cliffs, and it's incredible. But that CO2 is trapped in that shell. So it's a permanent way of getting rid of a lot of the greenhouse gas. That life has managed to find a way by using life. So here we go. Um, this is another algae, um, and it is able to release a gas called DMS dimethyl sulfide. DMS is fine. Dimethyl sulfide, I put both of those on the exam. Now, what you want or what the these photoplankton do is that they are able to produce this dimethyl sulfide gas. It smells like rotten eggs. And that actually becomes a seed for clouds. And the, when you get cloud formation, then you can blanket the sun and that way prevent the sun from warming up the earth to too high a temperature for life. So that is another example where life manages. Okay, so that's the reason for the cloud formation. Again, it's a tiny little microbe. Um, ocean salinity, the ocean because of the runoff, uh, is about 10%, even though because of our colonizing the earth, uh, the salinity of uh, the ocean should have gotten up. But it hasn't. So again, microbes to the rescue. And the microbes, let me go back here, uh, the microbes in salt flats. Now these are going to be um, kind of like the marshy areas around uh, the harbor, that type of thing. And these bacteria that are in these marshes are able to take the salt out of the water. And again, sequester it in such a way that it does not get returned. So this is another example of life managing the salinity of the ocean because all of life in the ocean is designed for about 10% sodium chloride. Anything too high or too low, massive death. It hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened because of life. Okay, one of the things that um, Lovelock was involved in is NASA wanted him to make an instrument to detect life on Mars. 
And so um, he raised the question, you know, uh, why Mars? And they said, well, we want to see if there's life. And he said, there is no life on Mars, not the way that we think of life. Right? There are no worms, there are no snails, there are no uh, fish, there's, uh, you know, this, none of that. And they said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, it's kind of like Goldilocks. Venus is too hot, Mars is too cold, Earth is just right. Yes, but he also had to scientifically prove it. There you go, what's my next one? Here we go. He said, Lovelock said, look at the atmosphere. I am not going to make it an instrument for a planet that's dead, that does not have life as we know it. And they said, what are you talking about? And he said, our atmosphere, our 20% oxygen, less than 1% CO2, and the rest nitrogen is because of living organisms. Living organisms can fix nitrogen, they can fix carbon dioxide, they can make oxygen, they can regulate that. You have to have life on Earth, and life on Earth has produced this incredible mixture of gases. Venus, 95% CO2, Mars, 95% CO2, and once upon a time before we had bacteria doing its thing in the primordial sea, Earth was also 95% carbon dioxide. So he said no to NASA, and guess what? To this day, life as we know it on Earth does not exist on Mars, and save American taxpayers, perhaps. All right, now, um, there is another example of a person other than Lovelock who also embraced this, and his name was Vernetsky. Vladimir Vernetsky. Now, what I'm going to say uh, it has a lot to do with the fact that when I was a kid, there was, you know, the USSR, there was the Berlin Wall, there was the Cold War, um, and so forth and so on. And there, scientifically wise, scientists in the USSR could not communicate with scientists in the West and vice versa but it was merely, we called it the Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain came down, scientists could not communicate. So find out much later, because this fellow lived in the, uh, I think he was born 1920, uh, and it was after his death and the wall came down and we were able now to look at each other's science, bodies of scientific work, that we found that Vernadsky's theory which he would call biogeology, was exactly Love, Love, Lux, Love Locks. And so um, that became another body of evidence. And I love the idea that this Bonatsky was a geologist, and when he was out in the field, started to realize that biology drives a lot of different geological phenomenon. So, he then came up with a different, I mean, it was the same theory, just a different way of uh, labeling it, biogeology. But he said the Earth's crust, which is the lithosphere, soils, uh, which is um, the crust of the Earth, water, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere, permeates, alters, produces, and chemically regulates, and is regulated by living creatures, especially microbes. Now, he is famous for this, quote, life is a disperse of rock, because he was a geologist first. And so he said he saw life as a geochemical process that transforms rock into highly active living matter. Now, there were problems in his day with locusts, locust plagues. I have a picture of a locust. The locust looks like little grasshoppers. But what would happen is locusts have a weird seven-year cycle, and they will hatch, and then the, the, the area that they are going to consume, which is uh, where the farmers have planted their crops, they descend, and they disseminate. They just eat uh, and just totally decimate crops. After they have eaten, they have sex, they then... 
a fly, have a flying uh, mass to another site miles away, and they then land and die. Um, and you're all set for the next seven years until that poor farmer wakes up one fine day and find another swarm of locusts and they repeat it. He said this is a really good example of biology affecting the planet, in this case the crust of the earth. So here comes some interesting uh, data. So a locust plague, which you always wanted to know, in a single day can fill 6,000 cubic kilometers of space and weigh 45 million tons. This can be seen as 45 million tons of soil converted into plant matter. That's the farmer's crops. And then into animal matter, the locust eats the crops. The locust flies miles away. I'm sorry, then it has sex and dies. And then when that dies and gets decomposed, becomes converted back into soil. So life is a dispersive rock. Okay, now those lovely little algae mats that we talked about that could fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and dump it into this shells, which uh, can then permanently remove the CO2 into the shell. They have the name from hell, coccolithophores. So these coccolithophores, which are really kind of beautiful um, microscopic algae that can explode and make these algae mats and then take the CO2, sink it into their shells. Um, and so coccolithophores are their name. Uh, and they are autotrophic, meaning that they're an algae, so they can get their energy from the sun. But what we're interested in is their ability to sink the atmospheric CO2 into their shells and have it be a permanent sink um, forever removed from the atmosphere. So they are autotrophic unicellular algae that secrete calcified CO2, right? Calcified, you need calcium, you need carbon dioxide, and you end up making calcium carbonate, which is their shell. And their secreted shell is called a coccolith. They are able to extract excess CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it into calcium carbonate. And that is what is used to build their shells. And there they are. They're so pretty. All of what you see on the outside are the coccoliths, are the carbon dioxide shells. So excess CO2 stimulates the growth of the coccolithophore, and it creates algae blooms, which can appear over expanses of ocean. And then they permanently remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. And this is an example, this is the algae bloom right here. This is the kind of the greenish blue algae bloom. Uh, this is actually Scotland. And Scotland around Glasgow had a lot of industry and a lot of high levels of CO2 in the area. And this is when the scientists started to see that when that happened, they would have the algae blooms and then they went out to explore. They, these are just clouds. Uh, this is uh, probably uh, around, I'm um, not really good in geography, uh, Scotland, this is probably where uh, you end up having Glasgow be the snick of the woods. Um, so that is the algae mat that is there because the coccolithophore senses the increased CO2 in the atmosphere. They have an explosion of growth. They sink the excess CO2 into their shell. They die, the shell sinks to the bottom, and that's the end of that. So, so this is another uh, diagram. This might appeal to you more. Uh, at times, I, I get a little confused about this up here, but anyways, here's the white cliffs of Dover. Here are the fish. Okay, I think this is the surface of a coccolithophore. Um, this is what the bloom of the coccolithophore would look like. This is supposed to be the ocean. Uh, and here are the little coccoliths. Ta-da! So, the
the story continues. Um, and then if you are at all interested in how life and non-living systems interact with one another and affect one another, there are master and PhD programs out there. So I want to just show you this. Um, this is from, I think, BU, where they have a program. And then as a, you would be working in teams and you would take an area of expertise, but you would also be part of a team. One person could perhaps be a biochemist, the other one could be a geologist, another person could be a paleontologist, and uh, then they would have this global way of looking at the earth as a living organism. So that's the end there. The end. And uh, so what I would like you to do is to look at the PowerPoint, listen to this lecture, and then do the um, Moodle quiz for this this week. And I will get back to you soon about the laboratory.